Um, but so I'm, I'm Ross Douthat. Um, I'm a senior editor um, at The Atlantic and a blogger for TheAtlantic.com. And I'm here with uh, Deborah. Go for it. Hi, Debbie Dickerson. I am uh, I blog for Mother Jones. I've published two books, An American Story and the End of Blackness, and I am teaching journalism right now at SUNY Albany. How's that going? It, both too fast and too slow. It's a completely different muscle. It's hard, but really good. There's a lot of young people out there chomping at the bit to become journalists, which is which it may, may be folly um, as, as I, based on how yeah. the journalism industry is going these days. Yeah, but. I was just telling, I, I give them the straight skinny on all of that, and what I really do is try to terrorize them out of being bad journalists, about joining the herd and, and doing unworthy things in unworthy ways. So, you know, I'm basically there to talk the, all but the determined, hardy, talented few out of the profession. Well, that's that's good. So you're the you're the equivalent of someone who teaches organic chemistry to, to freshmen to try and you know scare scare them scare them out of the pre med track. Interesting. I'm May, such a, maybe maybe I'm such a liberal the, you know, arts the, major. I didn't even know that that was the case. <laughs> yeah, it's like that. It's like don't. It's not for the. It's not, not for, for the, the faint of heart. It's not for right. the faint of heart. Only only the strong end up on blogging heads TV. So. <laughs> um, so anyway, so I, I thought we would we might start off uh, talking about presidential politics um, and specifically talking about everybody's favorite topic, uh, Barack Obama. Yes, um, yes. And I'm I'm sure I'm sure you've you've had a few conversations about him from time to time over mm, the course of the last year. Every now and then. You know. Every now and then, right? Yeah. You know, he, he pops in and out. Um, but I thought we'd start off. You wrote a piece um, maybe a year ago, maybe more, about uh, whether Barack Obama is black. Um, yeah. And I, I know you, you told me that this was one of the most widely misunderstood pieces you've, you've ever written. So I wondered if we could start off with you just talking about what your argument was um, right. then and what you think of your argument now a year into the race. Well, I think it's one of the most widely misunderstood articles that anyone has ever written. And it was such a firestorm, and I, I thought the critiques, which were barely critiques, were so unworthy that I sort of wrote it off. And then I found that really smart people that I look up to had misunderstood the piece, um, which leads me to, you know, to conclude that it's just it's a topic that is we're just still so knee-jerk about that people sort of lose the ability they lose their literacy, you know, um, and they couldn't, they couldn't even, they picked one sentence out of a 1,200-word essay. Basically what I said um, was that Barack Obama, you know, would be the great black hope if he were actually black. I wrote this piece for Salon January a year ago. I'll never forgive it. Forget it. Oops, there was a Floydian slip. I'll never forgive it. Um, <laughs> I'm that's sure what, that's, that's what we're yeah. here for, catching them all on tape. Yeah, I'm sure Obama will never forgive me. Um, apparently his campaign misunderstood it, too, although that might have been um, tactical. Um, when I say that he's not black, I don't mean that in a pejorative sense. Uh, he's not descended from West African slaves, so how dare you? You're an Uncle Tom, you're a carpetbagger. That's absolutely not what I mean. What, it, what, what I'm critiquing is the narrowness of the construction of the term black. And my argument, and this is the argument of my second book, which is called The End of Blackness, um, that all black really means, the way we use it in this country, it means people who are descended from West African slaves and who have been on the receiving end of bigotry and Jim Crow and segregation and all those sorts of things. Um, and my argument is that in a post-civil rights era, in a post-civil rights world, we should, black people, should be refusing to be confined to that restrictive notion of what black is. We're falling all over Barack Obama because he's black, but we're not talking about the fact that he's Kenyan. Um, and if he were, his access to blackness is through, he could talk about colonialism and those sorts of things, but what we're doing is sort of making him an honorary 
black guy. And I, I, so I'm critiquing the constrictedness of the notion, and I'm also critiquing it as an instance of, of um, white self-congratulation. Look at us, you know, look at, here's my new black friend. But it had to be a very particular kind of black friend, one who won't make you feel guilty by having been the descendant of slaves. One who is like Sidney Poitier, and guess who's coming to dinner, who speaks 57 languages and is the smartest guy in the room, and it's the whole exceptionalist notion. So my argument is that black needs to come to mean what Asian means, not a whole lot, until you ask a whole lot more questions. So it's a critique of the notion. It's a critique of white self-congratulation. It's not a critique of biracial people. My own kids are biracial. And it's not a critique of immigrants. Uh, black immigrants. It's a critique of the constrictions implicit in the category. But so you would like to see the category simultaneously ex expanded so that it, you know, so that it would include Barack Obama, so that we could say Barack Obama is black and mean that he is, you know, a half Kenyan. Um, right. Kenyan American. You'd have to say Kenyan American or something like that. And I think what But, but do you want the category to be to be emptied of meaning in a sense, or do you want its meaning to be expanded as well? Because it seems like a term like like Asian, for instance, at the moment, it's it is such an expansive term that it it's you know all not not meaningless. Obviously, it refers to you know people from Asia. Um, but there are so many subcategories contained within the term that to describe someone as Asian, it, it doesn't have anywhere near the resonance that describing someone as black has in America today. But what's the resonance that black has? Slavery, Jim Crow, segregation. Um, you know, these terms can only be imprecise, but a term ought to illuminate more than it obscures. And when when you have the uh, the I hate to use the word diversity it's so overused but when you have the diversity that we have in the black community if you have to choose between a term freighted with the meaning of slavery and Jim Crow and a term like Asian that means I have to ask some more questions before I do anything with this designation I'll take. I have to do anything, I have to ask more questions before I do anything with this designation. I mean, Asian is rightfully so expansive you can't do a lot with it. Asia is a big place. We're talking about, what, India all the way over to, what, China and Japan. And you got to ask some more questions. Are they Vietnamese? Are they... Uh, right. Laotian, are they Nepali? And it's a little hard to discriminate against people as a group when you're not sure who's in the group. You know, you're discriminating against somebody because you think they're Korean and it turns out they're Laotian or whatever. So it's, we, what about the fact of, the, the, to assume that a Nigerian cab driver who comes here with a PhD in economics that he can't use in this country, that he and I, who, you know, am descended from West African slaves, um, to, to assume that he and I overlap in any real meaningful way is insulting. And we don't know what kind of overlap there is until blacks who are not part of that tradition, immigrant blacks, get a voice. And I was really shocked that immigrant blacks were among the most offended people by what I wrote. And I had their backs. You know, I was saying you are being... Uh, bum rush from the stage, black people, traditionally black people, we don't want them to have a voice except where they overlap with the traditional paradigms. Abner, Luima, or Diallo, Luima, um, the people who come here and get shot by the police. Um, but when we were in our, our really hardcore opposition to immigration, do we carve out a special place for black immigrants if we're all black and we shouldn't be? And that's what I get. We're all black and you shouldn't be making these differences. Well, the differences are there. I didn't make them. And if we're all in the same group and we're all brothers and sisters, why aren't we fighting for African and Caribbean immigrants? So my argument is that until these people get to speak for themselves, I have no right to speak for them. I don't know what they think. I don't know what they prefer. I don't know what they want. They have a profoundly different history. They chose this country. We didn't. Right. You know, and leaving your country is such a huge... I can't imagine leaving my country and becoming a citizen of another country. I certainly can't imagine doing it illegally. Um, 
So they have to think that this is better than what they came from. And what they want to talk about, I would imagine, and I'm doing some research in this area, is not Jim Crow and redlining. I think they want to talk about business opportunities. I think they want to, I think they're more pragmatic in some ways. And let me, I've talked a lot, and I'll let you talk in a minute, but let me just tell you this. Um, <laughs> Asians, that big group, that big amorphous group, have this sort of left-handed compliment tag as model minorities, right? Um, but you know, the real model minorities in these country, in this country is African immigrants. They have more college degrees, more of their kids go to college, their, um, um, incomes are higher, they're doing extremely well. Um, there is research that shows that the majority of black, quote unquote black students in college are either immigrants or the children of immigrants. And the more prestigious the school, the much higher the percentage of black students who are not native born. So, I mean, let's just think about that for a moment. And what you've got is the same people who are mad at me are railing against this with writing articles titled, with titles like any black student will do. How crazy is that? How crazy is it to have a problem to talk about the overrepresentation of non-native born black students in college. So well, isn't 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 part of part of the concern and I, I'm not sure about this, but isn't part of the concern there that um, with with college America has a particular a particular approach to blacks in higher education that's informed precisely by the you know Jim Crow redlining um, era. Um, and, and I mean, isn't isn't part of the complaint about the overrepresentation of African immigrants in college that they're essentially benefiting from affirmative action programs that are designed for the descendants of West African slaves? I mean, is that? Well, I don't think anybody's taking. I don't think we're taking the time to make these distinctions. First of all, it's African and Caribbean immigrants. They're doing uh, much better too. So there's a lot of things wrapped up in here. Why, if racism is so awful, why are these people able to come here and outperform native-born blacks who've been here for generations? What, why can't we talk about that? Um, and to, to me, it's just not at all an easy thing to say those programs were designed for the descendants of West African slaves. I don't think we ever said that. I think we said black. And if the argument is that any black person, anybody with Africa in their DNA is black, and I shouldn't be saying Barack Obama isn't black, um, then what... Right, what, no, what I the, agree. Then, there's, right, then there shouldn't, then there shouldn't right. be a problem with... So, this, this so what I'm talking about here is cognitive dissonance. I'm talking about saying we're using a lot of code words here and we're taking a lot of shortcuts. And it is amazing to me. In my, I did an informal survey in my own classes and in my other my uh, journalistic colleagues' classes and it's something like 95% of our black students are either not native born or their parents are not native born. Um, that's pretty amazing. And why, what is, why are we upset about that? If we're all black and we shouldn't be talking about who's descended from slaves and who isn't, why is this an issue in the black community? And it's when you read these articles, they're almost funny the way they trip over themselves. Um, They'll use black in the same sentence, but in ways that completely negate. Black students are being left out while black students are taking all the places. What sense does that make? So what I'm talking about here is an existential issue. What I'm talking, that's what my second book was about. We've got to throw off the existential training wheels and stop seeing ourselves, those of us who are descended from slaves, stop seeing ourselves with that Du Boisian double consciousness, always experiencing ourselves through the eyes of white people. Oh, I can't go here because white people. When I moved to upstate New York, people kept saying to me, oh, my God, it's so white up there. How are you going to manage? I just it don't is, even see. It is see. pretty white. Yeah, okay. I don't see my I mean, life that way. I spent some time in upstate New York. It's, it's, it's quite white, believe me. It's quite and, uh, white. <laughs> there are times you just want to hug other black people on the street. But this this <laughs> this notion of, of the, the problem here is seeing ourselves through the eyes of white people and assuming that white people are always out to get us, and not only that, that they will be successful. Um, and I think 
that that is a mindset that immigrants, black immigrants, might not come here with. For one thing, and this is huge, they don't have the experience of being minorities. Where they come from, they're in the majority. And the people, less so in the Caribbean, but still, they're surrounded by people who look like them. And it's it's really hard for us to make y'all, I'm assuming you're white, I don't like you know. Like, Stephen Colbert, I tell you. Yeah, this is the problem. You, 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 yeah, you don't know. You, you used to be able to tell on the phone, even you know, Johnny Cochran to the contrary, but you can't tell anymore, um, always. Um, but they don't have the minority experience, and that's huge. And it's very, it can be sort of crushing for us. Um, and well, the problems that they had in their other countries were not about, you know, it was about colonialism or um, and that sort of thing. So, and I just don't think we can overstate the significance of choosing to come to this country and then having chosen it to come here and as a group do so incredibly well, better than a great many white people. Well, let me let me ask you this because I here or actually let me let me throw out a couple a couple thoughts. Um, one, one about Obama, um, because it seems to me that Obama is in, he, he's, he's in a particularly peculiar position because he is, he is the son of an African immigrant who came to the U.S. temporarily and then returned to Kenya. Right. So he's not in the position of, you know, the Nigerian with the economics degree who's driving a cab. He right. isn't someone who chose this country, and he's someone who was, in a sense, abandoned in this country by, yeah. his, by, his, by his African father and mm -hmm. you know, left with his white mother. Um, and, and it seems like what he's done, um, and I, I don't know about, I, I don't know to what extent this is applicable to the larger, um, the larger African immigrant or Caribbean immigrant experience, but it seems to me that he, and he, I think you can see this in Dreams from Dreams from My Father, his me, his memoir, because there isn't, because there is this incredibly powerful narrative of blackness in the United States, um, and you know obviously it's a narrative that's that's thick with horror and suffering and tragedy and slavery and segregation, but it's also a narrative that's you know thick with um, uplifting heroics um, right. and, you know, fantastic cultural contributions and great heroes and so on. I, I, I mean, I think you can see in his life a yearning to identify, to identify himself with that, with that narrative, with the narrative of um, native-born blacks, the de descendants of West African slaves. Simultaneously, you can see in his presidential campaign a sort of, a sort of step back from that and a step towards Partially, what what I think you described accurately is the the white desire to have, you know, to have the black candidate who moves us beyond race, and so a sort of attempt by Obama to, I mean, if you if you look at how he talked about race, especially before um, the whole Jeremiah Wright fire story right. broke and he gave his big race speech and so on, if you look at how he talked about race before that and contrast it with the way that he talked about race in his memoir and sort of you know his. I mean, his memoir is sort of about the pursuit of a racial identity, in a sense. Oh, and yeah. His, his presidential campaign, at least up until the last couple months, has been about the pursuit of a post-racial identity. So there's that, there's that tension. And then on the white side, I feel like in, in, the, in the embrace of Obama, there's a tension, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the double desire. It's the desire on the one hand to have Obama be a post-racial candidate who moves us beyond race and we don't have to think about it anymore and we don't have to feel guilty about it anymore. And at the same time, there's a tremendous identification with him as a black man, you know, the desire to, as, as you said, have a, have a black friend. But, you know, he's, he's the guy who's moving us beyond race, but the reason we're so into the idea of him moving us beyond race is because he's an African-American. Um, right. Well, that, so whole, I, I mean, that whole notion of moving beyond race, always uh, I always get very curmudgeonly about it. We're not trying to move beyond race. We're trying to move beyond non-whiteness. Because white people don't have to transcend race, right? Even though white is a race. Um, it's Asians, Hispanics, black people. It's it's us. So when we're talking about transcending race, I don't like to let stuff off the hook. We're not talking about transcending race. We're talking about transcending non-whiteness. And we're talking about, what's his name, um, who did the great book? Oh, 
Andrew Hacker. Andrew Hacker talks about um, being promoted, you know, to white, and he was saying 10 or 15 years ago that Asians were on the verge of being promoted to white. Um, so I have a problem with that whole, I think that in, that in the conversation that black people are trying not to have about right. non-native born blacks, I think America is trying to not talk about whiteness. And it, there's an extent to which you know, it's sort of like Obama's being forgiven for being black. And that's what I mean when I say it took it took a particular kind of black guy. You know, Raheem Washington with the exact same resume but with, you know, two slave descended parents would not be get the same oratorical skills, this whole thing, uh dancing on Ellen and baking jokes, um, would not be getting the same kind of love from white people. I think it was crucial that he not have the slave experience and that he had the African father who not only abandoned him, but abandoned America. Um, I'll take it any way I can get it, and I think Obama is definitely moving us ahead late years. But um, this this notion of trend, yeah, I think to get back well, to your yeah. actual question about his memoir, it was really, it was painful to me. Um, reading the profiles and reading his books about this quest for a racial identity, I I have nothing but sympathy for um, for blacks in his position who come here to this overwhelming, inescapable narrative um, that's not going to begin to break down until black people stop fetishizing it so much. Um, it's you you can't have another conversation um, that immigrants want to have, I think. Because it is so all-consuming, it's our original sin, it's our ongoing drama, um, and uh, it was painful to me watching him trying to figure out first, just trying to be a human being, and right. then, and I, I think there was no doubt that the way I, before I knew anything about him. Um, because I knew of him. He was at Harvard. He graduated Harvard Law School about five years before I started, and they were still talking about Barack Obama. Um, and when I got to D.C., I knew several black people who'd gone to law school with him. So I read his memoir back before anybody knew who Obama was. Right. And so it was a mystery. And I knew that, um, and then in reading about him, I knew that the way he was going to meld these disparate sides of his um, because of his, I, I think he has a sense of destiny, and because of his ambitions and talent, um, he was going to head for the public sphere, and he was going to be forced to either be black or not be black, you know. Um, and the way to be black was through the black church. So that this is something I've been writing about for a long time. It's very difficult to be, you pretty much have to be a black Republican not to um, to give in to this embrace of this this sort of fervent holy roller black religiosity, and I think that it's not at all surprising that you know he could have gone Episcopal, which is very white glove, and you know it's, it's mm -hmm. sort of black Catholic. But no, 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 he wanted to be a man of the people, and to do right. that, you got to go through somebody like Jeremiah Wright. Well, but so what? All right, so so to. to to go to the you know the topic of the moment, which is Reverend Jeremiah Wright and his relationship to Obama, it seems like in Wright you have a figure who, who 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 almost does both. I mean, on the one hand, as Obama himself has pointed out on numerous occasions, you know Wright is enormously active in 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 his community, and the whole you know the whole idea of of his church is dedicated towards you know sort of uplift that's rooted in the community, that's you know sort of Black solidarity and self-sacrifice, and based on and real so results, on. not just right. protest. Exactly, but, right. but simultaneously, you have, you know, you have from right some of the most. I mean, it's not just saying, you know, there, you know, I, I don't think there would be there would be anything near the controversy there is now if right had been saying, you know, the sort of the sort of generic things about racism that that Jesse Jackson always says, you know, right. that you know, there's lots of racism in society, and it's why. Too, too many young black men are behind bars and our drug laws are racist and so on. I mean, you have him saying instead right. that AIDS is, you know, created by the federal government right. um, as, and, and, you know, the, these these kind of right. things. And so, I mean, it seems like, you know, it seems like he, he contains so many contradictions. Yeah, it's landmark in the black community. There's no 
question. For anybody to call out a minister in a black community is mm -hmm. unheard of. But for you know a father, a son figure to do this to his father figure, who is a father figure in the national black community, the significance intercommunally cannot be overstated. Glenn Lowry, we were talking about earlier, to my surprise, wrote a piece that was fairly critical of Obama, and it seemed to sort of read like, you know, you had no right, speaking as a member of this community, to denounce, you know, basically the black prophetic tradition, which I found very surprising come, coming from Glenn, who I know and whose work I've admired for a long time. Um, this, this is why this is so huge. It's huge on a lot of levels, and in the black community, there is a lot of a lot of people are put off, and there's this sense of, it's not, it's, it's how dare you denounce a black minister's words, but ba but more importantly, how dare you do it at the behest of white people? Well, let and me let again, me read let me read actually what what here, here's a quote from what Lowry wrote. Um, I can't get past the fact that Obama was negotiating with the American public on behalf of my people in Philadelphia last week. In the process, he presumed to instruct a generation of angry black men as to how they ought to construe their lives. I am not really sure that Barack Obama has earned the right to do either of those things. Now, that's the reaction I was actually kind of expecting to the speech from the black community, that people would say, who is Barack Obama, um, you know, not the descendant of slaves, you know, upper middle class, Har you know, Harvard educated yeah. and so on. Who is he to instruct us? Who is he to sort of explain us our experience to black America? But I haven't heard that. I mean, I, I, I think the, the Lowry piece was one of the few places that, that actually took that line. I don't know. It, no, that, that's an emerging, that's emerging. And I think okay. that has to do with, you know, the teaching schedules of the black academy and that sort of thing. Uh, yes, that is an emerging, um, that's an emerging counter narrative. And I think this is, just as black ministers are dusting off their sermons and thinking about things, you know, not planning to hide, but they're just thinking about stuff that they've said now. Um, uh, the black community is going to be chewing on this, and we're talking about, you know, the, the black intelligentsia for the most part, is going to be chewing on this for quite some time. Um, but it goes back to my notion of Barack Obama not really being black, is he? This, this counter narrative of, you know, who are you to come in here and tell us what to do? Um, yeah, I think this is, is, is a term in search of a definition, the term of blackness. Um, I'm very surprised to see it from Glenn. What I saw early on was a lot of black writers with uh, divinity degrees uh, expounding on the black prophetic tradition of Frederick Douglass and, and Sojourner Truth. And then I read there some things, some great things from white commentators like E.J. Dion talking about the prophetic tradition and talking about some of the really, really angry uh, America bashing things that Dr. King said. Um, this, this, it's interesting to see where this will go in the black community. I'm still, I just read the Larry piece yesterday, and I'm very surprised to hear it coming from him. So I think that uh, this whole exist, I think we're, we, I, before I said we needed an existential crisis in the black community, maybe now we're having our existential right. crisis in the black community with Cosby and Chris Rock and Obama and now this whole thing with Reverend Wright. And it's, the, I think the bunker mentality is in place throughout with, with the ministers, but I think that the black intelligentsia is just starting to come out of the bunkers and really, really grapple. It's good. It's very hard for black, it, you pay a high price in the black community for intercommunal critiques. Believe me, I know that firsthand. So nobody's going to go off half-cocked on this Obama thing. Um, but I think Glenn, in his piece, certainly gave me a lot to think about. It go, this goes back to, you know, the white desire not, not to be, I mean, this is what Part of what Glenn Lowry's piece is about is that, you know, he doesn't he doesn't want Obama. He's worried that Obama is, in some sense, letting white America off the hook. And right. I mean, there, you know, there there right. is a sense in which white America wants to be let off the hook, and we don't want to be 
Right. Yeah, we don't want to be told that there are people in America who, you know, who, who don't think America is as great a place as we do and so on. So. And have the following reasons for thinking that, you know, the black incarceration rate, the schools, the redlining. I mean, on the one hand, America does a lot to make the black underclass feel like it's not a part of America. Um, you know, yeah. Um, so it's you can't then blame people for feeling, for realizing that they're being treated as second-class citizens and not fully part of the country, and then saying things like this. But it goes back Hi. to my point of you can't wait. You have to demand that your country treat you as a citizen. That's what the civil rights movement was all about. Don't invoke Dr. King without invoking that whole worldview and that whole uh, analytical system. So for you to say, I'm going to sit here in the sidelines and poo-poo America every chance I get, that's not what the Tuskegee Airmen did. That's not what my own father did. He volunteered to fight for the Marines in World War II, and he was so bitter about racism. The, the Tuskegee Airmen, all the, the, there have been blacks who fought in every war in this country, many of them enslaved. So... You can't wait around for somebody to tap you on the shoulder and say, okay, go ahead, feel like an American. You well, have to feel hand. like one, you have to act like one. And if you're going to act like one, you don't say stuff like that. I think there's so much work that needs to be done psychologically um, and existentially before we can engage outside the community. I think there's so many wounds that need to be healed um, in the community before we're in a place to participate um, as equals in, in any sort of uh, project aimed at... Well, I think the first question black people have to ask themselves is, do we want reconciliation? Sometimes I think some of us don't. We just want war. We want our apology and our reparations, and we want you to give us the southern half of the United States and leave us alone. I'm not sure. That's a basic <laughs> question that needs to be asked. What is it that black people would like to see happen? Do you want to live in peace and harmony with your fellow Americans? And I don't think that's an obvious question at all. Well, on that on that not obvious note, um, maybe maybe we should wrap things up since we've been talking for a while. Oh, um, we have too long. Too long, but no, it's been great. Thank you so much, Deborah, for doing this. I know I know there were some technological yeah, we, yeah, hurdles. Yeah, the scheduling says now I just I got to go to a PTA meeting, so that's my glamorous day. So well, that's that's uh, I'm you know I'm gonna go back and write a blog post. So I think yeah. you're, you're, you're you're ahead of me already. All right. Well, this was fun, and we disagreed. I'm glad disagreeing that's is good. fun. Yeah, and we I, came, I, I we came around things. to it. I learned some <laughs> things. You you put some things on my mind. This was fun. Well, so did you. Well, it's that's great. One one small step for. Uh, Truth and reconciliation. We did our part. We, we did, did our, our part. part. We heard each other out respectfully, and you admitted that you were wrong. So, hey, there we go. There we go. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All so, right. see you next Great time. Bye-bye.